occasional lecture series. <coughs> I'd like first to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country that we're meeting on, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people and their elders past and present. I'm, I'm delighted to have the job of introducing our two speakers today. Um, their work is looking at trust in political systems and issues that are affecting democracies around the world. Um, so it's an extremely topical seminar that we have for you today. Um, their work on the um, Australian electoral study has been conducted um, after each Commonwealth election over the last 30 years. And the most recent study has found that public satisfaction with democracy and trust in politicians has reached some of the lowest levels ever recorded. A question I suppose we're posing are, are these results indicative of rising popular disaffection with the political car, uh, class and are we looking at something that's similar to what perhaps we've seen in the US and in Britain recently in Australia? Using the results of the Australian electoral study, election study, the lecture will provide analysis of voter opinion in three areas, including trust in politics and attitudes towards democracy, assessment of the political parties and perceptions of the political leaders. To provide some of the answers to why we are witnessing such dramatic changes in how Australians feel about the political system and to offer some proposals for political reform, um, it really is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Ian McAllister and uh, Sarah Cameron. Professor McAllister is a distinguished professor of political science at the Australian National University and he's been director of the Australian Election Study since 1987. Um, that study is a large post-election survey of political attitudes and behaviour and his recent books include The Australian Voter and Political Parties and Democratic Linkage. Sarah is a researcher in the ANU School of Politics and International Relations and is co-author of um, Trends in Australian Political Opinion, which is a monograph. Her research covers political behaviour and political opinion in Australia and as well as cross-national comparisons. She's contributed to several major projects on elections and democracy, including the Australian Election Study and the Comparative Cross-National Election Research Project. Um, could you join me in welcoming them to give their presentation to you? Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And first of all, thank you very much to the Clerk of the Senate for the opportunity to present the results of some of this research. What we'll talk about in the next 40 minutes or so is what voters think about the political system. And that's broadly grouped into views of the system as a whole, views of democracy. Then we'll look at political parties, and then we'll look at political leaders. Now, the backdrop to all of this is the growing international uh, trend against established parties and politicians. We've seen this with the rise of populist parties and electoral support for what we call anti-politics politicians. Most dramatic of that has been the election of Donald Trump in the United States, but we also see it in France with the election of Emmanuel Macron. We've seen it with the Brexit vote in Britain last year, and we also see it uh, with Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the, the British Labour Party. Even though he's a leader of an established political party, he's very much an anti-politics politician. We've also seen this trend towards anti-politics uh, politicians in Australia, and we'll explain that in some detail using, as Jackie said, the opinion polls that we've been collecting, and in some cases going back almost 50 years. So what I'll talk about is views of democracy and try and disentangle a bit of that. And then Sarah will talk about political parties and political leaders. And then we'll finish off by speculating a bit about institutional design measures that might be implemented in order to try and re-engage the public in the whole process of politics. Now I mentioned we'll be using the Australian Election Studies Survey mainly. That's a survey we've been conducting at ANU since 1987. Uh, it's typically a sample of about 2,000 respondents conducted by mail immediately after each federal election. We did sample 2,800 respondents in uh, 2016. Last three federal elections, we've also had an online option. So we've given people the option of completing the questionnaire online as well as completing it in hard copy. <clears throat> 
We typically ask about 250 questions of the respondents, so we know a lot of information about their social background, their perceptions of the election campaign, what they think about issues, their voting history, and so on. And the survey that we conduct is by far the most comprehensive survey of political opinion that's conducted regularly in Australia. You'll see a, a website address right at the bottom there, australianelectionstudy.org. If you go to that website, you'll find a lot of information about the election study. You can download copies of the data file itself, which you can analyze um, to your heart's content. You'll also find lists of publications, and you'll find a link to a 2016 report that Sarah and I produced, which is downloadable in PDF. And if anybody would like a hard copy of that, if they want to email myself or Sarah, we'll be happy to put it in the post. So to turn firstly to views of democracy, we have consistently ask a question about satisfaction with democracy. It's a standard international question widely used in surveys around the world. And we classify people according to a four-point scale. On the whole, are you very satisfied, fairly satisfied, not very satisfied, or not at all satisfied with the way democracy works in Australia? What we find in the 2016 election survey was that satisfaction with democracy was at its lowest level that we'd recorded in any of the surveys with the exception of the period immediately after the 1975 uh, dismissal. So we find that in 2016, 60% of the people we interviewed were very or fairly satisfied with democracy, but that compares with 86% in 2007, which is a high point. The general trend that you see for satisfaction in democracy is it tends to be cyclical. So whenever a, a new political party is elected to office, you see an increasing public support for democracy, and we see that in the trend graph there in 1996 with the election of the Liberal government, and we see it again with the election of the Labour government in 2007. What appears to have happened is in 2013, the trend was broken. So we would have expected with the new government taking office, the trend should have gone up, and it didn't. It flatlined, and then it continued this decline in 2016. Now, it's quite a substantial international academic literature about this measure, whether it's actually tapping into what we think it's tapping in, in terms of people's support for democracy. One of the arguments against it is that it's very strongly correlated with people's sense of partisanship. So what we're actually measuring is the changing electoral fortunes of the major political parties. We're not tapping into what people think about democracy itself. Now, to counter that argument, we actually have other survey evidence using a different methodology and a different question, which leads us in the same direction, that there is very substantial declining trust in politics in Australia. And this comes from a survey that we've conducted at ANU since 2008, the ANU poll, now conducted by one of our AES colleagues, Dr. Jill Shepherd. That's conducted typically two to three times a year it's done by telephone, and we ask an open-ended question about what do you think is the most important problem facing Australia? So we're not structuring the answers. We're allowing people to give free voice to what they think are the major problems. The two major issues that people mention are the economies and immigration. And then, as you'll see from the trend, since 2010, an cre increasing proportion of people have men better, mentioned better government. And that leads us to believe that the trend for uh, declining trust in politics, particularly after the 2010 minority Labour government, is something that's actually real and is happening. Now, where does this place us within an international context? And we do have data from this from the Comparative Study of Electoral Systems Project. Uh, the data for Australia is from our 2016 survey the other data comes from typically around about four to five years ago in national election surveys conducted in those various countries. You'll see that uh, based on the 2016 result, we come uh, in between a whole range of countries. We're an intermediate. We rank 11th out of the 21 countries measured there. So we're just slightly behind France and Germany. We're ahead of Ireland and Poland. 
If we were to go back to 2007, where well over 80% of people were satisfied with democracy, that would have placed us along with Norway, Switzerland, United States, Denmark, a variety of other Scandinavian countries. So we've come down very substantially in terms of the international rankings, but I suppose the, uh, the good part of all of that is that we're still ahead of Greece, at least based on, based on these figures. The other indicator we have is a measure of trust in politicians. And again, we've asked that consistently in the election surveys since we started running them. And the question essentially measures whether governments are concerned with their own interests or with the public interest. In general, do you feel that people in government are too often interested in looking after themselves, or do you feel that they can be trusted to do the right thing nearly all the time? When we ran that in 2016, we found that trust in politicians was at its lowest level since the question was first asked in a survey in Australia in 1969. Almost three quarters of the people we interviewed believed that people in government looked after themselves. They weren't looking after the public interest. And again, if we look at the overtime trend for all of that, you can see something very similar that we saw for satisfaction with democracy. So when there's a change of government, as there was in 1996 and 2007, you'll see people become a bit more trusting, and then that trust tends to go away. But you'll also notice from 2007, the trend for trust has been consistently down from election to election. Now, one of the arguments that's been put forward is that this change represents a fundamental intergenerational shift in terms of political attitudes, that it's to do with younger people not supporting democracy and that they're not being sufficiently socialized into the whole political process. This graph addresses that issue. The top line looks at people who are satisfied with democracy in 2007, and then the bottom line looks at the trend for 2016. Intergenerational change appears to be part of the explanation, but it's certainly not all of the explanation. And you can see a very interesting pattern there. Support for democracy in 2016 is at its lowest level among people aged in their 30s, and then again among people aged in their 50s. If you compare that with the trend for 2007, there's almost no variation, except there's a bit of a peak for people aged 30 to 34, which was the Kevin 07 uh, effect. When we drill down a bit into the data for people aged in their 30s being less likely to support democracy, we find a lot of that is to do with sense of economic insecurity. People see weak economic performance. They're concerned about housing affordability and a range of related issues. So that largely accounts for the decline among people aged in their 30s. People aged in their 50s, when we drill into it, it's largely to do with the coalition's uh, commitment that they broke on superannuation, retrospective superannuation changes. And that had a big effect for people aged in their 50s and over, and it also had a big effect on the election outcome. So basically we have three groups of explanations for all of this. We have firstly weak economic performance that I've, I've mentioned. People feel relatively insecure. And we ask a range of questions about that in the survey, about their own economic insecurity and also their family's economic security. That has increased over the last three or four elections. There's also a very strong belief among voters that the government really can't do much to improve the economy, and I'll show you some results for that in a minute. There's a second group of reasons which surround this idea of the rise of the career politician that they're seen by voters as being untrustworthy. They have an inability to keep their promises. People are generally turned off by the overly partisan nature of political debate that they see. And also, politicians tend to encourage voters' expectations about government. They very rarely say they can't actually do something in terms of implementing a policy. And inevitably, when those expectations are unmet, then people become distrustful and alienated. And then there's two further groups of issues which Sarah will talk about in a minute to do with political leaders and partisanship. And just finally to show you um, the extent to which people 
and I believe that the government really can't have much effect on the country's economy. That's a question that we have asked quite consistently since 1990. And the question is, do you think the government will have a, a good effect, a bad effect, or no difference on the country's economy over the future year? And you can see that most people generally think the government really makes no difference, either positive or negative. But what you can see in 2016 is a very strong effect that only 19% of the people we interviewed thought that the government would have, a, would have a good effect on the economy over the future year. And when we disaggregate that by party support, we actually find that only a quarter of coalition voters actually thought their own government would have a good effect on the economy in the future year. So I'll hand over to Sarah, who's going to talk about the other two sections. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. To follow on from Ian's discussion of overall trust in the political system, I'm going to delve into some of the specifics of Australians' engagement with and assessments of political parties and the political leaders. Looking first at political parties in Australia, the Australian election study highlights significant changes in how voters view and engage with the parties. The survey has asked a number of questions on voters' assessments of the parties, and across the, this suite of measures, we see evidence that political partisanship is at its lowest level since questions were first asked, in some cases going back to the 1960s. The data shows that voters like the major parties a good deal less than they have done in the past. It also shows that partisanship for the major parties has reached record lows. Fewer voters than ever are using the how to vote cards in casting their ballots. And the proportion of voters that consistently votes for the same party at each election has reached 40%, which is the lowest level to date. A number of charts will help demonstrate these dynamics over time. This chart here shows trends in how much voters like the parties over time, where they've evaluated the parties on a scale from zero to 10. Um, so an evaluation of zero means they strongly dislike the party, and an evaluation of 10 means they strongly like the party. What it shows is that the popularity of the two major parties has decreased to its lowest level since the question was first asked in the early 90s. Up until 2007, what we see is that the relative popularity of the two major parties fluctuated. But since 2010, there's been a considerable decline. And in the most recent election, this is the first time where both parties failed to cross the midpoint of five on this 10-point scale of how much voters like the parties. And in particular, you can see that the popularity of the Labor Party declined very steeply from 2007 when Kevin Rudd won the election to when he lost the election in 2013 to Tony Abbott with all the leadership changes um, and my, the Labor minority government that happened in between. The popularity of the Greens has also declined over the same period of time, and particularly since Bob Brown stepped down as leader. Another measure shows the trends in political partisanship based on a question that asks whether respondents usually think of themselves as Liberal, Labor or something else. What this reveals is a gradual, long-term decline in partisanship. For both of the two major parties, there are fewer partisans than at any other time in the past 50 years. Around one third of voters now identify with each of the two major parties, 33% with the Liberals and 30% for Labor. The proportion of Greens partisans, meanwhile, has been gradually rising over time, reaching 9% in 2016. And there are an increasing number of voters who don't align with any party at all, 
are reaching one in five voters in the most recent election. So overall, this indicates that the influence of the major parties is in decline as voters look for alternatives. Echoing these overall trends is data on the proportion of voters who always vote for the same party at each election. This has declined considerably from over 70% in the 1960s down to 40% in 2016. And it's dropped over 10% just in the last two election cycles. Meanwhile, the number of Australians who considered voting for another party during the election campaign has been rising over time. This indicates a greater degree of voter volatility. To sum up these trends in how voters engage with the political parties, across a range of different measures, voters are now less likely to align with one of the major parties. And what we're seeing across these trends is not so much a case of drastic change since the previous election in 2013. Rather, it's a case of gradual change over time with voters drifting away from the major parties. And there are a number of factors that explain this decline in partisanship. A major factor is generational change. Younger generations engage in politics differently they're less likely to enrol to vote or join a political party, but more likely to participate in a protest demonstration or sign a petition online through a campaigning group like GetUp. So commentators sometimes complain about young people's disengagement with politics, but there's a good degree of evidence that suggests young people aren't disengaged, they're just engaged differently. Another factor is rising support for the Greens. Although there's still fewer than 10% of voters that identify with the Greens, uh, this has chipped away at support for the major parties. And also contributing to the decline in partisanship and negative perceptions of the parties. Visible party infighting is associated with declining support. For example, the Labor support the Labor Party lost a lot of support during the Rudd-Gillard years. And the election study data shows that overall voters have the impression that the government is run for a few big interests rather than all the people. As the parties are seen to be caught up in bitter party disputes and governing in their own interests rather than in the interests of the people they're there to serve, voters are really distancing themselves from the major parties. Turning now to the political leaders. Although Australia has a parliamentary system, politics has become increasingly personalised over time. Governments are often referred to by the name of the, their leader rather than the party, and the media gives increasing attention to the political leaders. Whilst leaders are not the only thing that matters for election outcomes, they do matter. And in the evaluations of leaders in this survey, we see some of the same trends discussed in relation to uh, satisfaction with democracy and trust in parties reflected in the leader evaluations. At each election since 1987, the Australian election study has asked how much voters like the leaders on a scale from zero to 10, where zero means they strongly dislike the leader, 10 means they strongly like the leader, and if they're indifferent, then that would be a rating of five. And what we see here are the average results from the 2016 survey after the most recent election. This shows that none of the party leaders were able to cross this midpoint of five on the 10 point scale. Malcolm Turnbull achieved the highest rating out of those leaders measured at 4.9, followed by Bill Shorten at 4.2. Previous Prime Minister Tony Abbott scored 3.6 on the 10 point scale of leader popularity. Now to put these figures into some kind of perspective, this chart shows the evaluations for election winners over time from 1987 through to 2016. 
What this shows is that Prime Ministers are a lot less popular than they used to be. Up until 2007, newly elected Prime Ministers typically enjoyed a good degree of support and popularity, with Julie Gillard, sorry, since 2007, since 2010, we've seen, we've seen a change. Julie Gillard, Tony Abbott and Malcolm Turnbull all uh, won elections without crossing over this midpoint of five, um, which indicates that people like the leaders more than they dislike them. So we really haven't had a popular Prime Minister since Kevin Rudd's election in 2007. To provide some further context on these leader evaluations, this chart incorporates both election winners in the darker blue and also opposition leaders in lighter blue, as measured in the post-election surveys. And the leaders have been ranked based on their evaluations. Kevin Rudd in 2007 had the highest evaluation at 6.3 out of 10, although by the time he went for re-election in 2013, he had fallen almost to the bottom of this list at just over 4 out of 10. In almost all cases, the winner of the election is evaluated more favourably than the opposition candidate, although there are three exceptions to this, specifically when Keating won the election in 1993 over John Hewson, and in the 1998 and 2001 elections, John Howard won, although he was less popular than Kim Beasley. So more often than not, the party with the more popular leader will win the election, but these exceptions demonstrate that you don't need to be a popular leader to win. And another example of this is Tony Abbott. His evaluation stayed the same in the 2010 election which he lost and the 2013 election which he won. What had changed between those two time points was that the Labor Party and its leaders had become so unpopular uh, that Tony Abbott had become more popular in a relative sense. And this chart also demonstrates the dynamics over time. We can see that of the election winners that succeeded with a lower level of popularity, these are all elections from from the past few election cycles. Um, it used to be the case that more popular leaders would win elections. In addition to evaluating how much Australians like the political leaders, the study asks voters to evaluate how well various characteristics describe the party leaders, including intelligence, competence, and trustworthiness. This chart here shows how Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten were evaluated. Specifically, it shows the percentage of respondents who thought the characteristic described the leader either quite well or extremely well. Both party leaders were perceived as being reasonably knowledgeable and intelligent although fewer than half of voters find the leaders to be honest, trustworthy or inspiring. Comparing the two leaders, Malcolm Turnbull was evaluated more positively in each of these areas, with the exception of compassion. Bill Shorten was considered more compassionate than Malcolm Turnbull. In terms of electoral outcomes, some of these characteristics are thought to matter more than others. Research in the US context has demonstrated that traits including competence and strong leadership are associated with positive electoral outcomes, whereas compassion, for instance, is not important. And these evaluations can also be put into context over time as the Australian election study has been asking for evaluations of leader characteristics since the 1990s. And the data over time shows that the current party leaders have some of the lowest evaluations to date. Both leaders score poorly in terms of trustworthiness, honesty and strong leadership. 
There's an example presented here, honesty, and we can see that Malcolm Turnbull is the lowest ranked prime minister in the list, prime minister after winning an election, and Bill Shorten is at the bottom of the scale overall. So we're seeing that our leaders are considered to be less honest than they used to be. And I've presented honest, honesty here as an example, but we see similar trends across a number of other measures, including trustworthiness, strong leadership, and whether the leaders are considered to be inspiring. A final area to explore regarding the leaders is the frequent leadership changes in recent years. We've had five Prime Ministers since 2010, that includes Kevin Rudd twice, and only one of these changes has occurred as the result of an election. Data from the Australian Election Study and the ANU poll investigates voters' approval of how the parties handled these leadership changes. It shows that a majority of voters disapproved of the way the Labor Party handled the changes. When Malcolm Turnbull replaced Tony Abbott, on the other hand, voters were roughly divided. 49% approved of, of the switch. What explains these differences in approval? Firstly, leader popularity mattered. Rudd was a Prime Minister who was popular with voters, so voters did not approve of the way he was replaced. In the case of Malcolm Turnbull replacing Tony Abbott, on the other hand, a majority of voters preferred Malcolm Turnbull over Tony Abbott, so they were happier with the change. There has also been discussion about whether Julie Gillard suffered disproportionately because of gendered expectations. This certainly isn't the only factor that played into approval or disapproval of the leadership changes, though the Australian election study data does show some gender differences. Men were more approving of the leadership changes than women in all three cases, and the gender gap doubled in 2013 when Kevin Rudd replaced Julia Gillard, where men approved of her being replaced by 10 percentage points more than women. So that would suggest that gender is a factor, but it's by no means the only factor. To tie in these leadership changes with trends in democratic satisfaction that Ian discussed, we can look at the relationship between approval of the changes and democratic satisfaction. Shown here is the data for when Malcolm Turnbull replaced Tony Abbott as Prime Minister in 2015. What it demonstrates is that those who strongly disapproved of the leadership change, a majority of them were not satisfied with democracy, whereas those who approved with the changes were more satisfied with democracy. And we can observe similar trends if we look at the earlier changes in the Labor Party. And we can also see this trend if we look at the measure of political trust instead of democratic satisfaction. Although this data presented here is correlational, this would suggest that the frequent leadership changes may have contributed to the dramatic declines in satisfaction with democracy and political trust. To provide an overview of what we've discussed, Ian discussed how satisfaction with democracy and trust in government have reached record lows. The popularity of the major parties and major party leaders has been in decline, and voters are more likely to consider alternatives rather than consistently vote for the same party. We're seeing less popular leaders win elections. When both major party leaders are very unpopular, someone still needs to win. Kevin Rudd in 2007 was the last Prime Minister we've had who enjoyed a good degree of popularity and support at the time. Voters have largely disapproved of the frequent changes of Prime Minister that have taken place in between elections since 2010. Now, some of these dynamics are unique to Australia, such as dynamics of the party system and all the recent leadership changes, 
Though declining satisfaction with democracy and government is also occurring in other advanced democracies for a range of reasons, including poor economic performance and generational change. So this has presented quite a pessimistic assessment of the current state of democracy in Australia. I'll now pass back over to Ian, who will discuss whether there's anything that can be done about it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Sarah. Just to finish off, um, we thought it might be worth really just advancing some possible solutions that might be implemented to try and re-engage the public in the political process. There's a group of possible solutions which really involve what political parties do. So political parties reforming their organizational structure, the way they select candidates, the way in which they engage with the public and so on. We're not really concerned with those here. What we're more concerned about is institutional design characteristics where the political system could be redesigned to try and overcome this increasing distrust. These are some of the suggestions that have been put forward here. We're not advocating these. We just think these are things that should be possibly discussed and their merits or, or otherwise should be looked at in a lot of detail. The first one is four-year parliamentary terms. That was obviously rejected at a referendum in 1988, but it's arisen as a, as a characteristic that people think should be brought back and give political parties, once they get elected into government, a greater opportunity to implement their legislative agenda and either be rewarded or punished for that uh, and in an election. Now, we did ask a question about four-year parliamentary terms in one of the ANU polls, I think three or four years ago, and we found that 70-odd percent of people were actually against it. So unless there's a concerted attempt by the major political parties to convince people of the merits of this, I would have thought it won't get up. Second possibility is Senate reform. The 1983 change to the Senate electoral system has in effect made elections to the Senate a party list system, as you would find in Europe. So the Senate has long ceased to be the representative of the states and territories, and it's now really a microcosm of what the political parties want in terms of representation. So there should be some consideration of what we think the Senate should actually do. And if the Senate is a microcosm of the House of Representatives, is that really what we want? And we might consider whether uh, other alternatives might be worth looking at. The next two term limits for elected politicians recall elections, they're widely used in the United States. And certainly term limits for presidents and prime ministers are widely used internationally. But they tend not to be used for representatives in a parliament, for legislators. Introduction of voluntary voting we have there because one of the effects of compulsory voting is to create very strong, highly disciplined political parties that have a very narrow membership base. So potentially, if you abolished compulsory voting and brought in voluntary voting, you would make political parties less disciplined, much more open to people, say, from business, professions, private sector, and you would also increase the membership base because political parties would then have to mobilize people to turn out to vote, which is something that they don't have to do at the moment with voluntary voting. And then there's a group of um, possible changes which we've got at the bottom there, which would essentially reform parliamentary procedures to try and make them less partisan. So one of the things we've got there is an independent speaker. Uh, another would be to limit the Prime Minister's question time, as it's done in a lot of the other Westminster democracies. But there's certainly others that we could discuss in terms of changing parliamentary procedures. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. I might stay down here if, if everyone can hear from the mics at the table. Um, well, that was very interesting. Thank you both. I think um, it's let us take a bit of a step back, having a 30-year survey it gives you a bit of perspective on, on the immediacy of things, doesn't it? Um, I think um, I'm 
take out of it a, a real sense that it's a very difficult time to be a politician um, and particularly a political leader. Um, and I have several questions myself, but I'll throw it open to the floor since I'll have a chance to talk after the lecture. Does anyone have a question? If you do, we've got a couple of roving mic holders who will come to you. Oh, I thought there might be a few. There's a, there's a gentleman here. Just wait for the mic to get to you, sir. Well, I was bracketing term limits and recall elections together, which are widely used in the United States. Uh, recall elections are uh, typically used in some of the Westminster democracies. Canada has it, Switzerland has it. I mentioned the United States, Taiwan has it. They all have different systems, but typically what it involves is a certain proportion of voters in a constituency saying that they wish to have a by-election, that they consider the the performance of their elected representative to be unsatisfactory and they want to elect somebody else or have the opportunity to elect somebody else. The question was a gentleman just here for it. For a point for discussion, I would have thought it could be very obvious that um, uh, a four-year parliamentary term... Take into the microphone. <laughs> might be difficult for the people in the back row, actually. I believe a four-year parliamentary term is an obvious direction for us to go because surely political parties in power would uh, have more time to concentrate on good government rather than getting themselves re-elected. So it surprises me that 70% uh, or something similar have voted against that and it's it's a point for discussion if you, if you don't mind. Well, I thought four-year parliamentary terms were fairly obvious myself until I saw the ANU poll results and it was fairly clear that most voters didn't support it. When we drill into that we find the reasons they don't support it is distrust of politicians. So they want to keep them on a tight leash. They don't want to give them four years. Now there's a chicken and egg situation there in the sense that if you had four-year parliaments you might argue you get better people in who were more responsive uh, made less promises and more likely to commit themselves to doing what voters want. Uh, voters obviously are not convinced that that would be the case. It's interesting when I've done research on this, the, the only country in the world that has four, uh, less than four year terms is actually El Salvador, uh, along with us. So three year terms are really odd uh, internationally. Most countries have four years, that's the median, and then other countries have five, such as uh, United Kingdom and so on. The, the issue is how you would implement this if you wanted four-year parliamentary terms, and it would really require a degree of bipartisan leadership that we haven't seen for a long time to convince voters that this was the right thing to do and to get them to vote for it in a referendum. correction there, the USA has two-year terms. They have an election every two years. Yeah, no, you're, you're correct. Yes, yeah. sorry. Uh, yes, two years for the lower house. Yep. Uh, there's a lady in the row just in front. Yep. I'm interested in the vote or the non-voting of young people. Do you have any evidence that eventually they do enrol to vote or does it look like once they've decided to engage with the political system in a different way, they continue to do that? Well, there's a, a combination of life cycle changes and generational changes. So in terms of life cycle changes, um, young people are less likely to enrol to vote than they have been in the past. And internationally, the literature shows that, that young people vote less. Um, that said, my understanding is also that there's been some generational change in terms of how the younger generation engages in politics. So not just younger people generally, but younger people today are more um, interested in, in protest, online activism and so on. Um, so as we'll, ha we'll have to see over time, but it's a combination. So 
you might have something to add to that, Ian? The compulsory voting is interesting because it requires people to vote. And if we look at the figures in Australia, 92, 93, 94 percent of people have consistently voted since compulsory voting was introduced. In voluntary voting systems, what we've seen is a collapse in turnout. And when we go into that, it's younger people not turning out to vote. So we don't see that very obvious indication of younger people's disinterest in the, the, the conventional political process. Where we do see it is younger people not enrolling. So if we compare younger age group voting age population with the, the, the actual proportion that are enrolled, we find younger people are not, not actually enrolling. Once they get past sort of the mid-twenties or so, generally they do go into the political process because they get homes, mortgages, families, things like that. They become much more integrated in the whole political process. When they're younger, they tend not to have those assets and responsibilities, they tend to move around a lot. So once they do enrol, they generally tend to stay there. Administrative. Is there a barrier to surveying more people? Like, at the moment, you've only got 18 people per electorate over, on average. So uh, to get a bit more power, uh, can you survey more people? I, I guess with a survey of this size, we can draw inferences about the Australian population. Um, but you're quite right that you couldn't, the sample size would be too small to draw detailed inferences, you know, within, an, with, at the electorate level. And it's the same if, you know, you're looking at a very small uh, subpopulation, um, the sample size isn't necessarily large enough. But in terms of making inferences about the Australian population, um, there's certainly a large enough sample size to be able to do that. If you want to give us some more money, we'll certainly increase the sample size. Robert Putnam and others have shown what are perhaps parallel trends in people in Western countries feeling dissatisfied with their community life and less secure in their families and communities. Do you have a, a sense of to what extent the um, dissatisfaction with democracy and the broader government sphere is, is really related to those other um, lack of satisfaction in their community lives and family lives and those other social trends? Good question. I mean, there's certainly an argument to be made in terms of economic performance having an effect on satisfaction with democracy and support for democracy. Um, and that's certainly evident in the international data. In Australia, I think we've got an interesting context because you know we're subject to the same forces as as other advanced democracies, but we've also had some you know, specific circumstances in Australia over the past um, seven years or so that could have undermined support for democracy, like the leadership changes that were discussed. Thank you. Um, you mentioned two statistics as far as Greens are concerned, 16% uh, near the end and 9% sort of as a participation. Could you just explain the apparent discrepancies there, please? Thank you. Discrepancy, I think, is largely to do with people who are actually partisans, who have a party identification with the Greens, and then people that actually vote for the Greens. Uh, partisanship and who people vote for, conceptually two different things. And one of the things we've noticed with the Greens over the last oh, 15, 20 years, is there's an increasing proportion of people who actually identify with the Greens as well as vote for them. What we find typically with minor parties, the Australian Democrats, One Nation and so on, is that there's a huge amount of churn in the vote from election to election, and people tend not to identify with them. What we've seen with the Greens uh, is that they're much less churn in recent elections, and they're gaining this core support uh, over time, which I think is probably quite important in terms of uh, ensuring their position in the party system. Mm 
Um, your data shows that people feel that politicians look after themselves rather than doing what's best for the country. Do your data show um, any um, cynicism that politicians are influenced by lobby groups and big donors rather than doing what's good for the country? We have asked questions about that in the election survey and I think what you're getting at is different types of influence and corruption. There's essentially three types. There's white, grey and black. Uh, white corruption is something that would be fairly minor, maybe an elected representative getting a bottle of wine from a constituent at Christmas. Grey would be an area where it'd be very ambiguous, perhaps maybe not declaring an interest in a company or something in the member of register, uh, register member's interest. And black corruption is where a politician would be given money, say, to change their decision-making behaviour. Voters are very intolerant of uh, elected representatives right across all of those, even in terms of white corruption. And interestingly, when we've asked the same questions of election candidates, we also run a parallel survey of election candidates, as well as voters, elected representatives tend to dismiss white corruption and so something just, just happens. Uh, not particularly stringent on grey corruption, and the only real agreement between elected representatives and their voters is over black corruption. So the political elite and voters really have quite different perspectives on a lot of this and the nature of influence in the political process. I've got a question around citizen juries in your list of possible ways to engage the public down there. Um, you haven't included those and a number of governments and jurisdictions around the country are using citizen juries to bring people back into uh, the process, not necessarily within the institution of, of politics or parliament, if you like, but still in a very influential way. Has your polling covered that at all or do you have any views on whether this is a trend that might increase, for example, to help with that issue of trust and distrust? Um, I think it is something that is potentially quite important and the whole area of deliberative democracy, getting small groups of voters together and empowering them to make decisions on behalf of the, the total electorate is something that's got great potential. There's a colleague of mine, John Dreisack, who's uh, devoted a, a large part of his career to looking at this. Citizens' juries, deliberative democracy, widely used in state politics, local politics in the United States and to some extent in Europe where there's very complex decisions uh, that have to be taken where ordinary voters wouldn't necessarily know the advantages and disadvantages. So things like uh, nuclear energy or something like that where it's a very complex thing, deliberative democracy has got great scope to provide a perspective on that. Where it's you're really just choosing between political parties and a party system in a regular election, much less influence. But certainly in the right circumstances, citizen juries could be really quite important in this process. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My question centers around the possible connections between compulsory voting and the level of informal votes. Uh, so I'm not quite sure over the last couple of elections just how the informal vote has run. But historically, uh, in our system of compulsory voting, the percentage of votes which are informal is really very low, surprisingly low, which would seem to suggest that there is a fairly strong connection between people's uh, uh, conscious, consciousness of what they're doing uh, amongst people who possibly wouldn't have bothered to vote if they didn't have to. And I wonder, wonder whether your studies have taken in this kind of issue. Well, I think in Australia, because we do have compulsory voting, uh, people do have you know, a, a stronger level of political knowledge um, than in countries that don't have compulsory voting. So that would contribute to fewer um, 
informal votes. In terms of the actual data, I'm not sure of that. Well, we have levels of informal voting in a comparative context. So countries like Mexico and so on have got much higher levels than we do, but our level would be uh, higher than, say, most of the other Westminster democracies. That's a consequence of several things. One is compulsory voting, because you're driving about 25% of people to the polls that wouldn't normally go there if it was a voluntary voting system. We know that because we asked people that in the surveys. We also have very complex electoral systems which change between the Commonwealth and the states and also between upper and lower houses. And then thirdly, we have a, a very substantial minority of people who are non-English speakers within the electorate. So all of these factors really should uh, predict a much higher level of informal voting that we don't get. And I think the reason we don't get it is that the Electoral Commission goes to a lot of trouble to ensure that the whole system is as user-friendly as possible. If you've ever tried to vote an election in a, another country, it's really not as easy as it is in Australia. And I think there's a lot of commitment there in the Electoral Commission to reduce the proportion of informal votes. I think you can hear from the questions how thought-provoking everyone's found your presentation today. And so I'd just like to ask everyone to join me in thanking Professor McAllister and Sarah Cameron. <laughs>